I'm going to talk about some of the pitfalls of, like, I've always remained on the periphery of the Course in Miracles world, and I never sought to be part of the mainstream, because after all, in that culture, you know, there's a whole culture of gatherings, and I don't condemn or judge any of that. That's just part of the circus of the world, and everything is part of a perfect curriculum, which we're all dancing in symphony with. But this is speaking about two red flags that I, I witness a lot in that culture. And it's, it seems to be something that's more common in the course community than say Buddhism or, although they have their own challenges or, or, or perhaps yoga, but there's this sense, um, First of all, if anyone tells you in, that they're enlightened, I think run a mile, like... The most advanced people I've met, they would never say that. First of all, that, you know, and I'm not saying judge those people who say it, because that's just you getting trapped, right? maybe look at what's talking there I'm sure they have come from a place of feeling there's something they've grasped that's really important but I've noticed that when I hear people say things like that they kind of it kind of triggers me which is my stuff and the other thing I wanted to raise was the bliss ninnies <laughs> and um, by bliss ninnies I mean I really think when Ken Wapnick said no, it's not my place to judge other people's path, you know, or their inner experiences. None at all. I can only work on my careful looking at the projections that I've been dealing with in myself and how I see the world and how I see the perceiver. It's interesting, that statement, to see the perceiver. But the thing about the bliss thing is, is that Ken Wapnick said, you know, and I, I really, I love this answer because I thought it was so noble. He was asked, you know, why would you study the Course in Miracles? And he'd say, run a mile from it. Like, don't go near that thing, you know? And he'd built his whole life around teaching it and his livelihood and everything. And his trust in inner guidance as well, which is paramount. There are many curriculum, sorry, there's a universal curriculum, but there are many syllabuses like Buddhism is one, you know, yoga is another, Advaita Vedanta is another, like organized religion like Catholicism and Anglicanism. All of these are laudable paths home. I'm not judging any of them. But this phrase that I use, the Bliss Nini characterized story, What I, what I mean by that is I met someone once that told me like inwardly all she felt was joy. And there've been periods where I just can't go near the Course in Miracles stuff. It doesn't mean whatsoever that the teachings of it are reverberating throughout my being and in my consciousness because I can't really walk away from that experiences the experiences I've had around it you know they've 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 made me into the the, the man I appear to be in my in my story but this you know meeting someone that was in a state of pure joy inwardly you can't tell what by looking at a person's face necessarily what's going on inside you can't tell with that well i think when there's a lot of anger and aggression and misconduct misconduct in the sense of like upset there's you can probably be sure that that person's not in a state of joy all the time but when someone's very placid 
and peaceful and not reactive then and if they tell you that then there's a good chance it's true and why would they want to lead you otherwise unless if they're selling you something and the people that have told that to me like the one person that told it to me that I really believed had nothing to prove like she told me the truth And I do think that people go on the course in Miracle's Path, do find plateaus of deeper and deeper wisdom and deeper and deeper peace. The Course in Miracles says you will know the teachers of this course by what they demonstrate, that is by their fruits, right? And the reason I love Ramana so much is because he wasn't teaching the Course in Miracles. He wasn't teaching any holy book in Indian culture. But you will know them by their fruits. You could have never met him, but I've seen enough from my inner experiences that he was really living the Course in Miracles. He probably never used the word Holy Spirit or Christ in his life. I've, I've never come across someone who was just so guileless about what was going on inside them. And he'd never say he was enlightened. I mean, he talked about it when people asked him, but he, he wasn't going off trying to like persuade anyone. didn't have a Facebook account saying, look at me, I'm enlightened, I've dropped all my attachments didn't have a Twitter account saying that. I mean, I think the, the, the job of psychotherapy is very important, you know? It, it leads you home. It leads you to a place of ending the pain mechanism that creates the pain body. But it's my sense that for most human beings, the spiritual path is, is generally very, 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 very challenging. That's my sense. I'm not trying to say you should agree with it, not at all. But in my sense, there is the sense that you are departing the idea that you live in the world that you were born, that you will die. And that you're upset. If we're honest, we frequently have, we feel bullied, we feel guilty for the, some of our behavior at times. All of that upset, whether we're on the receiving other end of others upset or lack of love or where guilty about us being witness to ourselves behaving in such a way. I'm upset because I see something that is not there. And the thing about The Course in Miracles that really stands out to me, and I've gone to the ends of the world, right? I've gone and lived in India to study yoga and I've studied Ramana Maharshi and in Tirunamalai and spent you know, almost 10 years in India and then I've gone to America and studied the Course in Miracles with one of the greatest teachers of the Course of his day, Tara Singh. And I've been to almost every cathedral in Europe, not be for the religious experience but because my mother was a fan of the art and the culture. And my cathedral was always the natural world. I was a naturalist as a child. But the thing that differentiates this teaching is that like, yeah, I, I do think if you go far enough into the hinterlands of the world, you will come across a Ramana Maharshi. You will find someone that is so exceptional. I mean, Ramana Maharshi is the, when I read the word Christ or I read 
course, I see his face in my mind's eye. I see him as a demonstration of that, that anointed wisdom, that blessed depths. But the thing about the Course in Miracles is it's taking you by the hand as long as you're ready and willing and able to look at the resistance inside yourself, which is the blocks to truth, to the depths that he's at. I never upset for the reason I think. Nothing. I've given everything I see in this room the meaning it has for me. I'm not a body. When I attack, I bind myself. In my defenselessness, my safety lies. These thoughts that, that are at the heart of the Course in Miracles system of looking at the world, the idea that the world wasn't created by God, it was created by the ego, these thoughts are words on a page at one level they are statements about the facts of what's going on on another level and they are invitations to immense courage because you're on a journey to deny the interpretations that have ruled your mind for eons and to drop the fearful perception of reality and that fear includes hate, pettiness, judgment, defenses, attack thoughts, insecurity in its almost unending manifestations, belief in death, denial of the body's needs when there's sadomasochism. I mean, there's so many manifestations of fear and attack thoughts. And, and, and my sense is, for most people that study the Course in Miracles, or anything which is, is as deep and as comprehensive as this teaching that it is, Ramana Maharshi's teaching is the same, different words, different symbols, different mythological context. But for any anyone that's taking that journey, you know, there's a lot of possible dark nights of the soul. There's lots of plateaus of getting this deeper truth. There's a lot of somberness and sadness and pain that other people can't see the world that, like you're trying to train your mind to see. There's so many, there's so many pitfalls that you can fall for. And in the end, you're, you know, left alone in the silence of your own interpretation and when i say silence i mean like the aftermath of your interpretation i mean ramana mahashi said the highest state in this world is the state of desirelessness because a state of desirelessness hasn't made the confusion real of the ego that says you're lacking something and you know, the very structure of the body's needs is based on food and shelter and money and attention and care, mutual care. And living a happy dream, as the Course talks about, that's a, a really lovely invitation. Because you know you're asleep in, in a world that is false and you're bridging a gap in your mind to the world that's true. And every painful feeling, every insensitive experience that you have at the hands of others or self is an invitation to, above all else, I'm determined to see differently. And you know, I've studied Buddhism and I've studied yoga and it's like, this other thing that differentiates the course, apart from how incredibly deep it is, is that it's like 
yeah, you'll definitely benefit from people who studied it for a long time if you feel aligned with those people to share their, their experiences with you and to share your own so you can see deeper into it. But there's no like, you know, hierarchy of priests and like esoteric depths that you get with the Kabbalah that if you're part of an elite group will be imparted and passed on to you. It's all there in the book, like right from the beginning, you know, it's like, and you just have to do the lessons and, and absorb the texts and meditate on the manual for teachers and look at how psychotherapy of the world functions and then compare it with what the psychotherapy of the course pamphlet on psychotherapy is saying. And there's a beautiful poem by Parmenides, the founder of Western civilization. And it, it has this line in it, the first line, it says, the mares of longing that carried me, the, the, mares, the mares that carried me as far as longing could go and beyond. It's like what you witness in the mirror of your experiences in the world is all your longing. It might be for a family or it might be for money or it might be for approval from people that you look up to. And the, you know, the mares that carried me as far as longing could go and beyond, right? That's really what the Course in Miracles is about because you've got all this longing, all this desire. And it's really kind of a, a form of violence to see that these teachings are asking you to go beyond that longing because who are you without your longing longing for that tasty food longing you know i saw mcconaughey this actor you know and he said you know i've got three things that i live by and he says the family that's around me i think and then um the pride i take in my work and then looking forward to something i think it was something like those three but you know a lot of old people go to go and get depressed because they're not looking forward to something anymore. And in the third stage of life in the Indian philosophy, the ashrama, there's this sense that you've drank fully from the beaker of life and the longing's gone and then God can enter. You know, that's the most sacred time because you're preparing to drop the body. And it's like the Indians saw that period as like consolidation of like having drunk fully from the beaker of life. And in Jungian views, you know, he said the first stage of life is about building up, following your longing, fitting into the society, finding your place. And then the second stage of life is dying before you die. And in a way, for me, like I, because I finally came across the course when I was 19 and the teacher of the course, and it was like, I've been trying to die before I die mm -hmm. since then, because that's really the spiritual path. Whereas, you know, and there's a conflict there. There's a conflict, a conf you know, there's conflict there because <clears throat> what I think I want and what the Course says I really need to recognize is my deepest want are in contradiction on a certain level, you know, and you see a lot of these people that are caught in the law of attraction stuff and they want to manifest this and they get really taken in by all the things they can manifest in the world. And then you know, be careful what you wish for, <laughs> you know. But then the mares that carry me as far as longing could go and beyond. I've always felt that was one of the most beautiful statements because our upset is because what we long for is taken away from us on some level or what we hope to expect from others or from ourselves isn't delivered on a plate to us sometimes and sometimes it is and that's all part of the plan of course because whatever you're supposed to do in this world of, of bodies and forms and activity um is fine you know and whatever you try to do that isn't supposed to happen you you can't make that happen you know and i suppose listening in that way <clears throat> with discrimination to what your destiny may really be about than the one you think your longing wants to take you to. Um, 
it's really what the course is about. It's about giving up. You know, a lot of suicides without the body suicide, a lot of deaths to adolescence, to this dream, to that dream, to this relationship, to this attachment. And that's what I mean by like, you know, often find these, what I call the bliss nini version of the Course in Miracles is, is a little bit, for me, I find it very, I find it, I wonder if the spiritual bypassing going on, I wonder if someone's like using, you know, I would not give you false hope, but I, I'm not saying they're doing, they're giving you false hope by their example, but in my sense of it, like to give up and give up and give up, give up and give up and give up. To give up attack thoughts, to give up defense thoughts, to give up this train in the mind that's attached to this conflicted character. To align with the, the, the decision maker and to think what's spiritual what feels right is the Holy Spirit, when often it's not. Often it's just your old casket of programming giving you a spiritual ego version of what you want to hear, you know? That's why I've always thought that like, probably the most dangerous teacher for the ego to be courting on, caught on fire and grow is the spiritual teacher role because You know, you have to get constantly naked and naked and naked before all the illusions that think you're on top of everything. And I do suspect that for the most part, the most advanced spiritual beings have to spend a lot of time alone and in an at least in anonymity like I often think that the people on the pedestals seeking out followers occasionally they're very very advanced but often they're quite machiavellian they're, they're looking for power trips and manipulating others you know just like CEOs often tend to be psychopaths <laughs> You know, someone like Ramana Maharshi, he never said he was a teacher. He refused to take on that moniker. And he said the question, who am I as the teacher? The Course in Miracles says, yes, you can notice that there are people more advanced along the path than you are and vice versa. But you will know them by their fruits. And, you know, putting on this mask of being a teacher which the course gives you the vehicle to do because it says the manual for teachers. And if you feel called to teach this stuff, then you have to be really careful because I don't think it's so much teaching in the form of getting on a platform and talking about it as I am doing here. This is just a fragment of my life, you know, it doesn't have really anything. I'm not putting myself in that role, but I'm talking about my experience of studying the course, which in a sense is a, a teaching by example, because we all teach by example. But I think, you know, all the people that I've met that have put themselves in, with one exception, uh, in my experience, speaking for my truth, they, they, and they were pushed, like this, this person I'm speaking of is Tara Singh, and he was pushed by Helen Schickman, the writer of the course, the scribe of the course, to, to teach it. But almost without exception, I think that there's a great danger to get up and put on that mask of being a teacher, even if you've had countless wonderful inner experiences. And, and often I've turned away from the course culture and the course teachings because I've not from the, the echo of the, the lessons in my head, because they go on anyway, they've, they've taken over and I'm grateful for that. But from this kind of 
listening state that it's also easy and simple and just have to apply it. And yes, it is simple, but I, I think anyone that tells you it's easy, is it their ego trying to force upon you how enlightened they are? And then they might say, well, I'm not seeking validation and run away from you. But, you know, you will know them by their fruits. And it's really irrelevant. You know, the people outside you that teach you the course, they have value, I'm sure, if you, whatever you glean from them, that's all good. But the only thing that matters is, have you brought this incredibly challenging thing to application? And often you haven't, right? You're just a mess. You're depressed. You're frightened. You're scared. You're seeking out mother and father figures. You're, you want a savior in a million forms when things go wrong, right? And that's, that's really where the course, the rubber of the teachings and the Course in Miracles hit the road because Jesus is saying that's not going to go away necessarily for quite some time. That certitude that comes fleeting at first. But keep at it until the shadows flee away.